So hello everyone and welcome to the February MyHack Learning Community event. My name is Liz Hannon. I'm a white woman with brown hair and glasses wearing a blue shirt. I'm one of the members of the MyHack or Minnesota Inclusive Higher Education Consortium work group. We're excited to see so many people today and um, we know that this is an important topic. So I'll just have a few housekeeping things before I begin uh, with the presenters. Uh, please use the chat throughout the presentation and we'll get to them during the Q&A at the end. The recording of this event will be available later on our website and closed captioning is enabled. Let us know in chat if you need any support to access this. And this slide that's uh, on the screen shows a logo with Minnesota Inclusive Higher Education Consortium written in gold lettering across a blue shape of the state of Minnesota. As we begin this event, we would like to acknowledge that in Minnesota, we are standing on Minnesota Makoche, the rightful homelands of the four Dakota Oyade nations, the seven Anishinaabe nations, and other indigenous peoples. We recognize that the U.S. did not uphold its end of the land treaties. It is the current and continued displacement of these and other indigenous peoples that allows the state of Minnesota to exist today. At the Institute on Community Integration, we affirm the, our commitment to address systemic racism, ableism, and all other inequalities and forms of oppression to ensure inclusive communities. So now for our customized employment presentation, I'm pleased to turn it over to Nicole Rabinowitz, our moderator, who is the founder of Inclusive Networking, a company in Minnesota that provides training in customized employment and services in discovery, job development, and ongoing support. Nicole? Thank you, Liz, for the introduction and the work group um, for having me moderate this wonderful event. I am a white woman with brown hair and wearing a black shirt with a gray cardigan. I will do my best to get to all, all of your questions in the chat and make sure they are answered throughout the presentation or at the end during our Q&A session. With that, I am so excited to introduce our presenter, Jacqueline Camden, who is a faculty member at Virginia Commonwealth University with a passion for supporting students with disabilities, transitioning and succeeding in employment. Her work focuses on preparing youth with disabilities to transition into post-secondary education and employment, career planning and development, collaborative employment partnerships, and supported employment on a college campus. I am pleased to turn it over to Jacqueline. Right. Thank you, Nicole, for that warm um, introduction and, you know, good afternoon. Um, as Nicole mentioned, my name is Jacqueline Camden. I am a white female wearing a green dress. I have shoulder length uh, brown wavy hair and I'm sitting against an off-white wall with a lamp and a couple of pictures. Um, and on this uh, first slide, I, I do have two pictures, one of a um, person job coaching in, uh, with a student working together to stock materials, um, and the second one of a student waving goodbye to her parents who are in a car as she goes to work. Um, so I am really, really thrilled to um, have been invited to speak today um, at your learning community. Um, so just I wanted to start by saying thank you uh, for allowing me to join and just spending some time with me today. Um, as Nicole uh, mentioned earlier, I do work at Virginia Commonwealth University or VCU, um, and my work really does focus on transition, um, inclusive higher education, as well as employment. Um, so today I want to really focus on and share one of the research projects that we're implementing at VCU 
And then how can we translate what we're learning from that study um, into practice, into our field? So I think it's really important for us when we're doing research, thinking about how does that research turn into practice? So I wanna talk a little bit about that today. Um, and then specifically how we can use customized employment um, within our inclusive post-secondary education programs or IPSI programs to enhance paid employment opportunities. So next slide, please. All right, so I just wanted to give you a little bit of background into our center before I really kind of jump into the meat of the topic today. Um, so the IPSI study that we will discuss is run through um, the RRTC on employment of transition age youth with disabilities, um, or what we call transition RRTC. So the transition RRTC um, is funded by the National Institute of Disability, Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research. Um, also known as NIDLER. Uh, so we were funded here at VCU um, for five years under this grant, um, and we started the fall of 2019. So the really the purpose of our center across the studies that we do is to generate evidence-based um, interventions uh, to assist youth with disabilities to enter competitive integrated employment. So that's everything that we do is really focused on enhancing um, employment for youth with disabilities. Um, so we are trying to accomplish that through uh, six different studies with a consortium of universities that include um, Vanderbilt, uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison, um, Kent State, and the University of Kentucky. Um, so each one of these studies really targets a variety of areas um, around employment, including um, pre -ETS. Uh, the impact of paid employment in high school, uh, a school to work program that we do here in Virginia, Start on Success, um, and paid employment in college. And so VCU, where I work, we lead three of those studies where our consortium of universities um, do the other three studies. Next slide, please. Thank you. All right, so today, um, as I said earlier, we're really going to focus on our IPSI study. Um, so what is that? It is a national study uh, that really looks at the effects of implementation of an online course. Uh, then we couple that with a year of technical assistance um, to any higher education program serving students with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So what we're doing is we want to know if providing training to program staff um, that provide these employment supports within IPSI programs will then increase paid employment opportunities for the students that are enrolled in college. Um, and then if those increased paid employment opportunities um, lead to a greater paid employment uh, opportunities post-graduation. So it's really that kind of trickle effect of training program staff to provide supported employment and those general employment practices. Um, and then hopefully that training and professional development will lead to better employment opportunities for students within um, their programs. Next slide, please. Thank you. So on this slide, uh, there is a picture of um, a desk with office supplies that includes uh, markers and a document with a bunch of post-it notes on it. Um, and for some reason, uh, we picked the longest name possible <laughs> for the study. Um, now, uh, I have to say this repeatedly, uh, but the study is called The Effects of Trained Personnel Providing Employment Supports and Higher Education Programs on the Employment Experiences of uh, College Students with Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities a quasi-experimental study. Um, so that's the name. If you see, you know, see it out, that's what we call it. Um, and just kind of a very broad overview. Um, we have three cohorts or group of participants that enroll in the study over these five years. Um, the participants are all inclusive higher education um, staff working with students um, with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So all the participants that engage in the study enroll in a course, um, and the course is on implementing supported employment in college. Um, so those that complete the course um, can self-select, um, so they're not randomized, um, so they'll select on whether they then want to move forward with receiving a year of technical assistance from our staff 
or um, whether they do not. Um, so, you know, during this time of doing the course and the technical assistance, we're also um, collecting some really good pre and post data um, on metrics such as number of paid employment opportunities, uh, post grad employment outcomes, and number of unpaid career related experiences, um, really to get a sense of what the um, training has um, that impact on students that are enrolled in their programs. Um, and I will highlight kind of more of the course and the technical assistance in a moment, um, but we're not going to go kind of too in depth in the nitty gritty of the study. Um, but if you're interested in kind of more in depth information, um, uh, please visit kind of our, our website uh, transition.vcu or rtc.org. And I do believe that uh, that link will be dropped in the chat later on. Um, but today I really wanna spend more time on what the outcomes of the study are so far and really how that is impacting our practice. Next slide, please. All right, so why are we doing this study? Why is this important? Um, so we know that people with disabilities really are more likely to be unemployed than their peers without disabilities. And people with intellectual disabilities specifically have some of the lowest employment rates. Um, and we've seen some improvement over that um, over the last years, but really not enough. Um, but we also know that students that enroll and graduate from IPSI programs have a much higher employment rate than the national average. Um, and Think College did a study um, and found that not only is, is the employment rate of students graduating from IPSI programs higher, but those students um, that enrolled and then were able to access paid employment while enrolled are actually 15 times more likely to have paid employment after graduation. And um, to add to that, when Think College was examining what these predictors are to post-graduation employment outcomes, they found that while paid employment is a predictor, unpaid career-related experiences and activities are not a predictor of post-grad outcome. Um, so, you know, while these unpaid experiences might have value, and they do have value, students were seeing really need more than those unpaid experiences. So it's not about just being enrolled and having some of those career-related experiences, but having that access to paid employment is very critical to increasing those outcomes. Um, so with that being said, though, only about 50% of students enrolled in those current tips at programs have paid employment. Um, and you know, when we started to think, why is that? I think there's a lot of reasons um, for that. But I think some of it is due to the fact that not all the staff developing and running programs have a background in employment. So we know that a lot of folks come from a academic or an educational background. Um, and that is wonderful and okay, um, but you know it might be a little bit more challenging to implement paid employment without that background knowledge and those skills um, to do employment. Um, there's also a real lack of professional development, especially for um, IPSI programs on really how to assist students in paid employment. So, you know, folks aren't having the background, but they're also not having um, a lot of resources to help them grow in those skills. Um, and we, we certainly know, and I know Nicole could speak to it, that there are a lot of resources on supported employment, um, but there's very little that target um, college level implementation. Um, I myself have been an employment specialist in the community. I'm in high school to school to work programs and in IPSI programs. And you know what I found is employment services and support do look different on a college campus. There's some nuances there. Um, so you know, building those relationships, securing the placements and strategies that we implement look a little bit different than those that we might use in the community. Um, so we really wanted to see if we could address this lack of training and professional development while increasing those paid employment rates um, because as you see you know getting those paid employment experiences are very critical um, so we wanted to see if we could um, have an impact on that next slide please 
All right, so as I mentioned, uh, we have developed an online course that is meant to really enhance staff's ability to increase paid employment. Um, the six week course that we've developed is called Supported Employment in College, Increasing Paid Employment for College Students with Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. Another unnecessarily long name that we came up with that I have to say often. Um, but within this course, we really covered six core topics um that go around supported employment one um quality indicators of supported employment and ipsy programs um discovery so how do you get to know your students uh, we cover job development so um, how do you take what you know about that student and work with employers to develop those paid opportunities um, customizing employment and ipsy programs which we will really focus on today um, job site training. So once a student gets a job, how do you actually support the student on the job site? Um, and then preparing for uh, that kind of post-graduation success and that transition. So uh, we talk about and we have a checklist of steps to take as students are transitioning out of the program that really helps um, establish them uh, for successful post-grad employment attainment. So during each one of these six weeks, um, the course participants review the content through videos, engage in discussion through um, those written discussion board platforms. Um, and then we do provide additional resources that support that specific topic for the week. Um, currently, we've had all three cohorts go through and complete the course. Um, so the course is completely finished for our study. Um, now, currently, we're actually looking at turning that um, uh, course to a self-paced option. So it can be actually widely available to anybody that might want to um, take it. Um, so after the, the participants finish the six week course, uh, they can choose to enroll in a year of free technical assistance. Um, so I like to describe the course as that foundational knowledge um, to supported employment and employment practices. The technical assistance really provides support that's individualized um, to the program specific needs. So for example, um, a program may want to spend the year focusing and diving deep onto uh, job development processes for their program. So that's what we'll focus on for the year. Um, the technical assistance facilitator and then the program staff really work to get together to develop their goals um, and an action plan based on the needs of that program for the year. So for the technical assistance, we've finished our first two cohorts um, and are currently completing our third and final cohort um, now. So we'll be done with all three cohorts around December of this year. Next slide, please. All right, so um, that was kind of a really broad overview of um, our study. And for the rest of the time, I want to kind of focus on the concept of customized employment because it's a, a concept and a theme that we heard a lot about. Um, and there was a lot of needs around how to do customized employment in our study. Um, and so, we're, you know, I want to really talk about what we are learning um, from folks and then how we can embed this strategy into um, our programs. Um, so, you know, over the last three years, we've learned a lot about the implementation of employment supports within IPSI programs, um, especially that customized employment, as I said. So through discussion board posts, the assessment data that we're collecting, and the technical assistance, um, we're hearing from a lot of programs that they believe that customized employment, um, which I will define in a moment, is a really useful tool, um, and they believe that it can be effective within their programs, but they're not actively implementing customized employment as a strategy. And so when we kind of dig deeper um, into why that might be, um, we found that there were some barriers that uh, participants were um, reporting that we kind of heard over and over again. So some of the barriers that um, were reported was one staff to student ratio. So customized employment really does take some time and staff effort. Um, and when 
programs have large cohort numbers and low staff numbers. Um, programs do find it pretty difficult to um, have the time to work closely with employers to customize positions for their students that might need it. Um, and I really do think uh, staffing is kind of a global issue in IPSI programs, um, but it really seems to be impacting um, access to paid employment and the types of strategies that programs are using um, to access that, uh, those opportunities. We also uh, heard the lack of student access to transportation is a barrier. Um, you know, again, transportation is a major issue to accessing employment for people with disabilities across the board. So this is not new, uh, probably not a new concept to anybody on the call, but, you know, we are seeing this issue in higher education as well, um, especially in um, colleges and universities that are located in more rural areas and do not have that public transportation. Um, and so that really means the number of employers that they have to work with um, to customize positions um, really does decrease. And then another um, kind of barrier that we picked up on is low expectations of staff um, towards students' abilities to work in paid positions. Um, so it's very interesting to me because staff seem to have high expectations as they should for students to go to college, but we're still kind of at the low expectations that students can work in paid positionings right out of the gate when entering college. Um, so we're hearing that some staff don't necessarily believe that all students are ready for paid employment. Um, this notion that students need to have some paid unpaid experiences um, before they can earn a paycheck. Um, which is interesting because this really isn't a requirement for um, other, you know, their peers in college without disabilities. But for some reason, you know, it's still kind of the expectation of students enrolled in IPSI programs that they need to have some unpaid work-based learning um, opportunities or internships um, before they can access um, and are ready for paid employment. Another barrier that we're hearing is that kind of perceived lack of buy-in or those low expectations from employers. Um, so not just staff, but also the employers that staff are working with. Um, so we've had uh, staff report that they don't use customized employment because it's too time consuming for employers. So employers just want, you know, folks to uh, apply to open positions and you know, they're not really open to working to customize a position, um, or maybe they won't work with, um, you know, the program in general, because the employers just aren't buying in or aren't bought into the program to begin with. Um, so, you know, we just have a lot of reports that um, employers just aren't willing to engage in the process, um, whether that's actual or perceived. Um, and then finally, just the general lack of knowledge and training. So we've talked about this, that need for more professional development around customized employment. So, you know, we have staff that express that they've never tried because they were never heard of customized employment before, or have heard of it and were just kind of unsure where to begin or how to implement it as a strategy. Um, and, you know, not every staff uh, member expressed these barriers. There were certainly programs that are implementing customized employment or planning to and didn't really see these barriers. Um, but still, I think of these emerging themes, they're really important to take note um, of as a field, as we're really starting to develop some training resources for staff working in IPSI programs around employment. I think that some of these, you know, themes are things that we might want to target when we're thinking about professional development. Next slide, please. All right, so I've said uh, customized employment a lot already. Uh, so now I want to kind of define it for you. Um, for those who haven't ever heard maybe of the term customized employment, the Department of Labor does define customized employment as a process for achieving competitive integrated employment for a relationship between um, employee and the employer that is a personalized, um, that is personalized to meet the needs of both the employer and the job seeker. And then WIOA updated that definition of supported employment to include customized employment. So, you know, I really do believe that for students with intellectual disability, 
good supported employment is customized employment. Um, so customized employment uh, uses that process of discovery. So it's a process where you learn and gather um, really good information about an individual that creates this profile or picture of a student that is used to help really direct um, that customized job development and developing these customized positions. So really the foundation of customized employment is the discovery process. Um, and I, you know, to me, customized employment is an important strategy for all of us who work in IPSI programs to consider using. Um, and so some reasons why I think that you should buy into uh, using customized employment as a strategy. Um, one, you know, it leads to interest-driven opportunities. The very nature of customized employment is that it meets the interests, skills, and needs of a student along with the business. Um, so I will say while any paid opportunity is better than an unpaid opportunity, an interest-driven opportunity is best. And customized employment really gets you there. Um, also, there are finite or limited opportunities on a campus. I work at a larger uh, urban campus, but even then there are limited opportunities for, um, you know, reaching out to employers and paid opportunities. Um, you know, we don't really have access uh, for the most part to an entire city or really large geographical uh, location. Uh, for many reasons, uh, you know, many paid jobs and internships and IPSI programs are on or near um, campus. One of the reasons transportation, like we've talked about before. But when you're customizing those positions, it allows you to reuse or recycle businesses um, really in a, a new and unique way, kind of over and over again. So in, when you're working in programs and supporting students, you might not be able to find a uh, new business every time you have a new student, but you can certainly change the way you, you utilize established businesses for each student. Um, and customized employment helps you do that. Um, really then finally, customized employment meets employer needs. Um, and I'm gonna keep saying this over again, but customized employment is a symbiotic relationship where the student and the employer's needs are met. Um, and when you are meeting the needs of your employers on campus, all of a sudden your program is viewed as a valuable resource to those employers because you're bringing that pipeline of employees that are really meeting their needs in a specific way. Um, and we see that when you are bringing value and you're a resource that um, you become very valuable to just the employer community um, and you'll have people that reach out to you. Um, so, you know, just remember that customized employment can really be a valuable tool um, when you're looking at how to obtain those paid employment opportunities for your students. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so at this point, um, I am hoping um, that you have bought in that customized employment uh, is a viable strategy. Um, and But even if you are convinced, uh, you might be wondering kind of how do I do that? What does that look like within my program? Um, so I wanna spend um, some time really talking about three major steps uh, that we use when we implement customized employment in ACIT. So I'm gonna talk about how do we put this concept um, and this research behind customized employment into practice. Next slide, please. All right, so on this slide um, is a picture of a, a white male sitting at a desk with office supplies and a pen in his hand, smiling at the camera. Um, so the first step is being um, able to engage in discovery. So as I mentioned earlier, discovery is really the foundation and the first step. Um, and it's all about getting your, um, to know your students' strengths, interests, preference, and needs. Um, so you need to take some time to really discover and get to know your student before you start working with employers. Um, and some of the ways that you can do that through an IPSI program is through person-centered planning. I do think um, us as a field do a really good job with person-centered planning. Um, so this is a really uh, good opportunity to start pulling some of that information um, because not only do you have access to students, but you also have access to their support networks. 
Um, so when you're in those meetings, um, put that like career hat on and really start listening to that information that you can pull out and um, translate into that picture or profile of your student to be used when you're conducting job development. So not just planning for classes or you know, social engagement, but also using that information for employment. Um, another way is assessments. Um, I will be the first to tell you that I actually don't use a lot of traditional assessments um, in our program. A lot of the assessments I believe actually aren't very accessible for people with intellectual disabilities. Um, in our program, we do more assessing in authentic settings um, and in ways that are a bit more ideal in capturing and observing students than those um, you know, computer-based or paper and pen um, assessments. But I will review that assessment data um, if that they're submitted uh, with the application. Um, so sometimes we ask students if they have previous you know, career-related assessments that they can send that as part of their application packet. And we will certainly review that um, to complete that data and report as we review the student. Um, another really great place that you can get to know the students kind of in the beginning of your program is the interview process. Um, so, you know, thinking that discovery can begin even before the student is enrolled. Um, so at ACIT, uh, not only do we have kind of a panel interview, but we have a day on campus. So students come um, on campus as part of the interview, they get to join a class uh, for the day, have lunch, get a tour, and also complete a work assessment uh, while they're on their day here. So this is just really a time um, we get to observe and interview the student on what they like, what they don't like, their strengths, some conditions for success, and really more natural environment. Um, and also a part of the interview, we do conduct a family interview um, to learn more about the student from family members. Um, and discovery is not kind of a one and done thing. Um, it is an ongoing process and should continue throughout the program. Um, so even after the person center planning meeting, those interviews, kind of the initial getting to know the student, um, we will observe students throughout the semester, throughout their time in the program, in more natural settings in the classroom and in employment sites. Um, and these um, observations really help to um, either confirm our initial assessments or maybe change some things as we get to know the students a little bit more, do some more observations in more natural environments. Um, and then uh, lastly, you know, observe students through work-based learning experiences as needed. I do realize um, earlier that I said unpaid experiences don't predict employment outcomes, but they can be a useful tool um, to help students kind of discover and explore. Um, we will uh, at our program have students engage in job tours um, or shadows when we have a student that might be a little unsure about what they want to do. Um, unfortunately, we find that uh, we're still seeing students with intellectual disabilities having very uh, limited exposure to diverse career fields um, doing, during K through 12. Um, so sometimes we need to provide that opportunity here at ACIT, um, but this also gives us an opportunity to observe and assess um, while they're in, doing that work-based learning um, experience. Um, and so, you know, as students' knowledge and experiences grow within their career field, uh, their employment skills, interests, and needs, those will shift as well. So this is why it's really important for you to continue to discover um, and make sure that your what you're learning about the student remains updated. Um, and just, you know, remember that implementing customized employment looks a little bit different in college. Um, so we never stop. Um, discovering about the student. Okay, so um, you gathered all of this great information about your student. Um, you have a really good understanding of their goals, strengths, interests, uh, needs, and conditions for success. Um, so now, um, step two, you want to take all of that information, that kind of profile that you've created, and use it to target employers to reach out. And you really do this by assessing 
your already established relationships to see, um, you know, are there employers that might be a good fit for the student based on what you've discovered? Um, and then if you, you know, decide there really aren't any already established relationship that seem to align, then you want to begin um, really to reach out to those new businesses. Um, but once you target that business, uh, it's time to meet with them and identify their needs. Um, so remember, it's, you've learned about the students' needs. Now we need to learn about the business needs for customized employment. Um, so you've reached out, uh, you've done your spiel on your program um, in the students, and you've gotten a meeting uh, with the employer. Um, here's that time when you're, it really, if you can, I know COVID's made it a little bit difficult, but if you can, it should be a face-to-face -face meeting um, so that you can really start figuring out what those employers' needs are. Um, and so some of the ways that you can do that is through um, conducting informational interviews. I think informational interviews is one of the greatest tools that we use in order to assess those business needs. Um, so this is really where you get to interview an employer to learn more about their business functions and needs. Um, so there are a variety of different questions that you can ask during an informational interview really to get to know a business. But I wanted to share my top three um, that I asked that really um, helped me kind of assess those needs. Um, one, what tasks are not getting done, um, but should be? Um, what tasks could be taken off someone's plate um, so that they can focus more on those critical aspects of their position? And then finally, I have a student with an interest in, so you share what their interests are. Um, and then you ask them, where do you see see that fitting in within your department? Those three questions really, um, to me, pull out um, the needs of a, a business and start giving you an idea of those tasks that you might be able to pull together for a job description. So while you're on the site, um, and this is one of the main reasons it's really important to try to get face to face, is to ask for a tour. So you've done your interview um, and then ask for a tour before you leave. And this is where you can really conduct a workplace analysis. Um, and this will provide you with ideas on the environment and conditions of the site, other tasks that could fit for your student that maybe wasn't mentioned in the interview and really the overall culture. So it's not just the tasks, but it's important to know the environment, the structure and the layout of the business as well. Um, you might also wanna think about reviewing any current um, position descriptions. Um, so we're not, while we are kind of looking for this customized positions, um, reviewing those open positions may um, give you an idea of some additional tasks that maybe you didn't discuss or you didn't see um, that are of a need of that employer. Um, and then also what the employer needs from a job description. Um, and then finally, you know, keep in mind that customized employment is a collaborative experience. Um, so it's not just all on the program. It's not just all on, you know, the staff to identify um, potential needs and tasks, um, but you want to make sure that you're really sharing students' strengths, interests, and preferences through a resume, through those conversations, um, so the employer can get um, really a full picture of your student and then help provide you with some ideas on what their needs are and potential tasks. So it really is collaborative experience. Next slide, please. So on this slide is a picture of two people dressed in business attire, shaking hands um, over a conference table, and then another person looking on and smiling. So the third and final step that I wanted to talk about in um, kind of the customized employment to process is um, creating a job description. So, you know, you want to bring together a, what you know about the student and the business and really start to develop what that new job, that customized position would look like. Um, so this description will include maybe completely new tasks that have never been done, but need to get done at that business or restructuring of existing tasks to create the new position, or maybe a mix of both. So you'll have your new um, kind of customized job, maybe a, a mix of new or aligned um, tasks. 
within this description, you might also want to include kind of a work schedule, pay rate, and a title, um, just to have draft out for the employer. Um, and then once you kind of have a, a completed draft, you want to send it to the employer for their feedback. So the draft is really just a starting place for negotiation. So you may go back and forth a few times with the employer to talk about what works, what doesn't before you have a really confirmed job description. Um, and then once the position description is agreed upon, um, then of course you want to support the student and the employer through that hiring process. Um, and sometimes when you're working through customized employment, um, the employer is like, this, we're good to go. The student has the job. Let's just do the paperwork. But I um, really want to um, highlight the importance of practice interviewing. So even if the employer is really on board and they're like, they've got this job, ask for them to go through all that traditional, traditional applying and interviewing process as well. Um, and I recognize that, you know, these three steps are really a simplified version of how to complete customized employment. Um, I don't think in, you know, the time that's allotted, we can go in a lot of depth. Um, but I think that it's a really good place to start and start to think about how to move through and customize employment. Next step. Right, so on this slide, um, this picture of two people sitting at a desk looking at each other. Um, one person is sitting in a chair and the other is sitting on the desk. Um, so, and I also on the slide just have some helpful tips or strategies for when working with employers. So these are just some things that have been really important in my work um, and have really helped kind of facilitate the process. One, um, have a system to track business in campus connections, um, whether that's kind of a spreadsheet um, or you know, a document where you're just housing all of this, because this will be the first place um, you will go to identify those businesses to target. So you want to have some place that's central for your program to collect all that kind of contact um, connections and information. You want to make sure that you're developing employer-focused materials using um, you know, business language instead of academic or education um, language on your materials. I know a lot of our program marketing materials might have kind of education language, but you need to make um, things specifically for employers. Now, utilizing your campus um, career services and centers so you don't have to do it alone, they're a great resource. Um, you know, take the time to listen, um, observe, and build rapport. Building those relationships and really listening to employers are a really critical component of customized em employment. Um, so you really don't want to um, miss that step of building rapport. Thinking about creating one pagers or video resumes that you could use with employers. Um, and just really thinking outside the box um, and making sure that it's, you know, employer focused and you're getting employer input and it's not just what you need, but you want to really make sure that you're, you're figuring out what the employer needs. Next step, please, or next slide. All right, so um, on this slide is a picture of an ASIC graduate. He's a young black male smiling at the camera. Um, so if you want to hear more about what customized employment looks like in action, um, I encourage you to check out a webcast uh, with an ACID staff member and student in a campus employer, um, really talking about their experience with customized employment. So you get to look, hear about customized employment from a student in an employer perspective. Um, and I believe that the link has been dropped in the chat. Next slide. All right. So as I wrap up, um, I do want to kind of take a moment and bring us back um, to the research and discussion um, and really discuss some of the considerations for the field um, based on that information that's coming out in our study and what we're seeing in the field. Um, you know, I think one thing we really need to look at um, is the structure of paid employment within IPSI programs. You know, paid employment can and should begin kind of day one, semester uh, one. Um, but, you know, I think there's some things that, um, that programs really need to do that. And one that's more training that targets um, employment supports. 
more research that targets barriers and solution to employment, um, really looking at how do we increase those values and expectations of staff and employers that we work with, um, and then just more funding to support increased staff. Um, a staff of two is going to find is not going to really be able to do um, you know sort of employment with thirty students. So we really have to look at those staffing needs and how do as a field we kind of increase some of that funding to support it. Right. Next slide. All right, so um, if you want more information regarding this um, study um, and or any of the things that we talked about, we will be, um, as I said, making that Supported Employment and College course self-paced, and that will be released towards um, the end of the year, around September, October. Um, we will be having some manuscripts out, one on um, customized employment coming out, um, and then also we're always doing webcasts on our studies and the information that we're learning. And, um, you know, we don't corner the market on customized employment. It's something that we're doing within our program. But if you want some more information on um, customized employment kind of outside of us, I do encourage you to check out BCU's Disability and Rehabilitation Research Project on customized employment. Um, Mark Golden Associates, who really is a pioneer in customized employment, and then, of course, Nicole and her team at Inclusive Networking for Minnesota. Um, these are all great resources to learn kind of more about customized employment if it's something that you want to start implementing in your programs. And I believe all these chats are going to be dropped to, or all the links will be dropped into the chat. Um, well, I think I'm at my time. Um, so I really appreciate, you know, just the space to talk about this topic um, and look forward to answering some questions. And Nicole, I'll pass it back to you. Yeah, this is Nicole. Jacqueline, thank you so much. This was beyond a wonderful um, um, event webinar. And we will open it up for questions and you guys can just um, put them in the chat. Um, any questions or comments? Um, but to kind of start us off while, while people are putting in their questions, I was just curious, I know you had a slide um specifically talking about um you know the barriers to implementing customized employment mm -hmm. um in college campus were there um you know what were some of the you know the successes of of doing this in college yeah um so i think that people found that um using supported employment was actually very successful i think that people um, with a lot of the barriers um, to, you know, we talked about transportation, um, you know, when you can relook at your resources on campus, because folks were talking about, hey, we can't get out to the community to work. Um, and we have a smaller, you know, campus or university. So we would talk through those issues of, well, when you use customized employment, um, you can kind of reuse those employers over and over again in a different way um, to really meet what your students' interests are. Um, and so I think that for a lot of the, what we see, especially in technical assistance, is just about doing it. Um, that I think there's more fears than there are you know actual barriers to the implementation so even with the kind of low expectations um, we've had programs that have always done unpaid experiences and then find that when they implemented paid employment the students did did it and did very well um, but it's about having some of those supports and those structures so looking at job coaches and the staffing to provide that um, that support beyond just job development, but also on the site. Yeah, and it actually goes right into a question someone has of um, how do you handle the workplace supports on campus? So I'll talk a little bit about our staffing structure here at ASINT. Um, so we do have a career coordinator that really oversees and re is responsible for all of our job development. Um, however, we also have job coaches. Um, we have one full-time job coach on our staff, but then we hire um, student workers. Um, we also have 
interns as well that act as um, job coaches. So we've created a kind of streamlined training process. Um, so every semester we're hiring new student workers. So they go through kind of our training process and then they're providing that um, on the site support throughout the semester. That's great. Um, there's another question. How many hours per week do you target for work experience during college inclusive programs? Um, so for our program specifically, and it's definitely a range um, I've seen on different programs, uh, we kind of have this model where it builds upon each other um, for students uh, first starting out, we have them work about 10 hours. Um, and that's what matches well with their coursework, um, their course schedule, plus they do um, education, coaching and tutoring outside of the courses. Um, so they are working on site about 10 hours. And by the time that they are um, on their last semester, they're at about 20 to 25 hours because they're focused more on that, those employment um, experiences and less classes by their last semester. That's great. Another question, was part of the low expectation barriers also from families concerned about the impact paid employment may have on social service eligibility? Um, for example, concerns about reducing the amount of social security received. Yes, yeah, so we don't have that concern too often. I actually, I do hear that concern from other programs. We, we do hear that through our study often. Um, but the amount the students are making in the number of hours typically that they're having in programs working don't in impact um, that SSI that much. Um, we do have some of those concerns you know, leaving the program and those uh, post to grad jobs. Uh, but, you know, our, um, we have agencies that will provide that benefits counseling. Um, so students and families have a full awareness of the impact. Um, so we've never really had a concern during the program, but certainly when we're looking at those post um, grad um, opportunities, we will take some of those concerns in mind and, you know, work with the student and family on what they what makes sense for them in terms of wages and hours. Great. Once the training is made available to IPSI staff, do you envision making technical assistance available to staff completing the professional development? Um, not as intense as our technical assistance is now. So currently in the study, we meet with programs um, once a month as well as provide resources throughout the month um, and do other things. Um, so we just don't have the staff uh, capacity to continue meeting with um, folks uh, monthly beyond the study. However, um, our staff are always open to emails and phone calls and questions um, to talk with other programs. I, I love when other programs get together and talk. I love being contacted. So if you take the training and have some follow-up questions, I would love an email or a phone call. That's great. And I, I just think it's great that you guys are making this more accessible to others and, and finding ways that more people can have access to it because it's just so needed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, another question, do you collaborate with the Department of Rehab Services for supports from agency paid personnel? Um, yes, so we do have a vendor agreement uh, in our program with our VR, and they um, pay a portion of students' uh, program fees, and within those program fees, um, are is funding for staff so they're paying a portion of those fees on top of um, tuition and other expenses um, when deemed um, you know eligible for that as well but yes so we do have an agreement with our VR to help pay for and fund staff oh that's great so then the follow-up question would be um, are all students enrolled with rehab services is that something that is required no, I mean, federally, um, you can't require that, it, you know, VR is a, um, is, is not a, it's a voluntary service. Um, so we don't really require people to be a part of that um, because that then excludes folks that don't choose to be a part of VR. 
Um, um, but we do highly encourage it. So when we, we do our applications and we do like family student welcome nights, we do highly encourage it. And we will um, work with uh, folks that are interested in getting connected to get, so we'll send referrals and walk them through the process, but no, we don't require it. That's great. I think that is it so far from our chat. These were wonderful questions and thank you again, Jacqueline. And I think Liz is going to go over the next slide. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you both so much. What a great presentation, so helpful. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll just have a, um, a couple of notes here. Um, to wrap up, we have Singhi will be putting up a poll and we'd appreciate you giving us feedback, everybody. Um, and then also we will have um, time for more discussion from, um, from 4 to 4.15. If you can stay, we'd love it. If, if you can't, um, then thank you for attending. And um, we're really so grateful to you, Jacqueline and Nicole, for for joining us.